Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Dr. Salah Fawzan's um, book on Islamic monotheism. Okay, it's basically Akidah Tawheed, and it's been highly educational for us. We're going to continue discussing Isaac, Abraham, and things along that nature. Let's begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That is, Ishaq, Isaac, he also called another Halim forbearing. He said, So we gave him the glad tidings of a Halim, forbearing boy. Quran 37 101. That is, Ishmael, however, a knowledgeable one is not similar to the other nor is a forbearing one similar to another. He also called himself, saying, Truly Allah is ever all here, all seer. Quran 4, 58. And he called some of his slaves here and seer. He said, Verily, we have created man from nutfa, drops of mixed semen discharge of a man and woman, in order to try him, so we made him hearer, seer. Quran 76 2. But one here is not similar to another, nor is one seer comparable to the other. He also called himself the kind and the merciful, saying, Verily, Allah is for mankind full of kindness, most merciful. Quran 2265. So don't forget some of the attributes we're also talking about oneness in names and attributes. He also called one of his creatures kind and merciful, saying, Verily, there has come unto you a messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him, from amongst yourselves, i.e., whom you know well. It grieves him that you should receive injury or difficulty. He, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is anxious over you to be rightly guided to repent to Allah and to beg him to pardon and forgive your sin in order that you may enter paradise and be saved from the punishment of hellfire for the believers he peace be upon him is full of pity kind and merciful Quran 9 128 so essentially here when Allah is the all-seeing, all-hearing, he has that attribute for himself. Yet in Quran 76 too, uh, we see that we humans are also here and seer, but nothing is in creation is like unto Allah. Even if we have the ability to hear and see, it's not on the same scale. Okay, Important to remember that. But a kind one is not similar to the other nor is a merciful one to the other. So also he described himself with attributes and described some of his creatures with like attributes. For example, he said, quote, and they will never encompass anything of his knowledge. Quran 2, 255. So that's also a very potent line when atheists will be like, can God be, you know, outwitted, defied, and they think they can create a computer to kind of be on the same level as, as God because they can program it with extensive amounts of knowledge. But we as Muslims would see that no. Allah's knowledge far exceeds our own and that we are not to worship our own minds and become overly arrogant right in our own intelligence so he described himself with knowledge he also described his creatures with knowledge saying and of knowledge you mankind have been given only a little Quran 1785 so that's a very important ayat for us we have only been given a little bit of knowledge and if you think about our daily tasks 
what we have to do just to survive. You take away electricity, washing machines, we gotta purify water. We got some problems going on, right? We are gonna be hunting. It's quite a lot when we're in our real natural state outside of an artificial bubble. Even though in our artificial bubble we are still just like the pigeon chasing bread. So, wake up, go to work, parents wake up, tend to the kids. It Pretty much our life is not around residing and relaxing, it's about uh, productivity, right? With moments of pause. And our knowledge is really around that area. And it takes people making huge sacrifices in order just to get a little bit of knowledge in a certain area and then the general masses don't really res respect all too well those who dedicate their lives to knowledge and even then those people, the scholars of their field, only have a little bit about them knowledge and they only have knowledge of that one particular subject. So we can't put our brain on a such a high pedestal to the point where we become defiantly disobedient and lose our humility. Atheists really do um, feel like the human mind is the end all be all to it. It's really quite strange. He also said, but over all those endowed with knowledge is the all knowing Allah. Quran 12 76. It takes a lot of humility to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows more than you. It's really arrogant to think you got all the answers and that humans will always have the answer. But those who had been given knowledge said dot 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 Quran 2880. He also described himself with power saying, Truly Allah is all strong, almighty. Quran 2240. So, okay, truly Allah is all strong, almighty. You have a lot of uh, people who mistakenly say um, equal and opposite reaction. S so they kind of have a yin-yang uh, contest going on with how they describe uh, good versus evil. They put shaitan on the same level as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, they put the devil on the same power level as God, right? And for us Muslims, we don't we don't do that. Allah is all strong, so Allah is stronger than Shaitan. He's more mighty than Shaitan, but Shaitan affects us. It doesn't affect Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That's the important distinction for us as Muslims to remember, because people will mix up their theology as if okay so Christians will have Jesus arm wrestling with the devil and I've seen that art and in Christianity you see that a lot where at times they put the devil almost as a second deity as in like the devil has reign all over earth and authority and that God somehow isn't really thwarting the devil when we see here that in our theology Allah is almighty, the most high, all strong, perfect, free of need, all knowing, all seeing. Shaitan is a jinn and he approaches us from all sides, all angles and has legions but nothing is allowed to touch us except as Allah permits. So if Allah permits Shaitan to test us that was happened by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if he keeps evil away from us, that was from his mercy. You see? Verily, Allah is all provider, owner of power, the most strong. Quran fifty one fifty eight. So all provider. This is important because a lot of occultists will say that Shaitan will give you everything in this world if you worship the jinn and you summon demons and do all that and you'll have your own power and you'll have your own destiny that you can shift and thwart 
because you have captured some sort of power, but no. We as Muslims can't believe it. Okay. Doesn't matter what certain people prophesied. If they are not sanctioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a prophet, who cares what you or say the future will be? And a jinn can tell you one truth braided with a thousand lies. So don't put your trust in something that was created. Put your trust in Allah alone, who is the creator. Allah is he who created you in a state of weakness, then gave you strength after weakness, then after strength gave you weakness in gray hair. Quran 30, 54. This is also very interesting because as mothers, we give birth to these little tiny humans who are so delicate. You see a little baby get the flu or cold, you'll see a mother like losing her hair, struggling, little tiny preemie babies, mothers doing everything they can, and then the baby gets strong, we grow up, but then we age, and our bones become frail, we bruise easily, right? We don't have the same strength that we used to. Our beauty fades and turns gray, right? So we have this very unique life cycle where strength is never given to us forever. And so when you have these occultic feminist women who are in the prime of their beauty, just having this sort of Judith Jezebel spirit where they are just so infatuated with their own farts, you just gotta sit back and pity them. The nastiness and viciousness, the vainness of when you're 18 to 30, if you use your beauty as a weapon and you rely on it and you think that's some sort of black magic, aging will come for you. You'll get those Disney villain eyebrows and that, you know, pointy eyeliner and umbrella eyelashes. And you can wear weaves and wigs and dye your hair all you want, but you are aging and you must let it go. In American Horror Story, I think season two, which was called Coven, I forget, the main character is a witch who wants to stay young and beautiful. And I found this to be very an interesting storyline. It's such a dark show, but um, I watched it before I was a Muslim because I was really into horror. And it is so telling time after time and so many myths and legends and folk tales and just common sense how many women grasp onto beauty at all costs. If you tell women that doing the most abhorrent things will guarantee their beauty, they'll do it because they value their beauty because they are actually slaves to the male gaze. But the fascinating thing about the witch is she thinks she's free because she's using her beauty as a weapon to destroy the mind and hearts of men and to just gain material items from them. But in reality, she detriments her own sanity and peace and harmony because she's actually enslaved to the male gaze and wants to be seen as forever beautiful in their eyes. And so her strength that she thinks she has forever is a true test because she'll become a hag, losing her teeth, you know, getting that really thin paper-like elderly skin. She will lose it. You'll become weak, as we all do. So women have to learn to not turn to the dark arts and listen to the riddles of those those madams, pimptresses and others who do black magic and stuff like that to harm men and children and to try to gain temporary beauty for a couple more years because Allah is all strong almighty, the owner of all power and he's already decreed our cycle for us. He's already decreed we are to age. We are to lose that beauty. 
use it to get your husband and then let it go it's gonna fade just like a man's strength his testosterone uh, will evaporate even if he takes medications he goes into a war zone he goes into poverty can't afford his testosterone he's gonna go back into a feeble state as well so men have to also let go of trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger and they can be as fit for as long as they can but eventually the walker the wheelchair the cane come for us all and so you have to focus on doing good deeds that's what I get from this and so on it is known that the names and attributes of Allah are specific to him and are according to what befits him while the names and attributes of creatures are specific to them and are according to what befits them it is not necessary that similarity in wordings and meanings should imply similarity in reality truer nature this is due to the lack of comparability between the two this is obvious and all praise be to Allah so the similar words doesn't mean that you're gonna have the similar abilities in reality so the same word of knowledge is used but that doesn't mean you're going to encompass all the knowledge. You'll get a fraction, and you should be grateful for that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made you a dependent, uh, disabled person. At the mercy of your fellow citizens. And at the mercy of your caregivers forever. And so if you use your intelligence for evil, especially in the scientific field, if you become a villain and you use your intelligence and abilities to create corruption on the land thinking that you own some type of secret power to change the way humans look change genetics do Frankenstein mutilations of people because of their mental illness and whatnot you'll be held accountable for that because you don't actually have any power and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold you accountable. So throughout these, we see who really has the authority and where we are. Yes, the octopus, the great white shark, the orcas, the dolphins have their own intelligence for their habitat. We humans have some intelligence for our habitat. But that doesn't mean we then start to lose our humility. Let me know what you think. Because this section really gets us to examine what it means for Allah to have his attributes and how the wordings are used, our place within the world, and what that means for us going forward, and how we manage our own place on this creation okay because it's important for us to resist shaitan and to know what we do in our lives and that it'll all be written down I get excited for how many books I want to read before I leave this reality and Quran 2 255 and they will never encompass anything of his knowledge except as he permits the last part right I told Kersey also mentioned that you can learn and you can earn those good deeds spreading knowledge spreading goodness a lot can make you have dementia in your old age and everything you did can be taken back and you can become weak there are so many brain diseases memory inhibitors so many chemicals in our foods and in different pills and side effects that are erode the memory of people 
erode the metabolisms, right? So use our health and strength to do good, not to serve Shaitan, his legions, and to be in rebellion against Allah, and then only in our weakness do we then turn. It's better to turn than never. But while you're strong, discipline yourself. Don't trivialize sins. Don't become unfearful. A woman's beauty, her modesty, it's a mighty tool and a mighty weapon, but you only have it for a little time. And if you use it to spread corruption, to do haram, to do sins, you think you got some type of power because you are physically in shape and health and Allah hasn't tested you. And then you start thinking that you are in control of your own life in terms of what's going to happen to you when you die and what goodness comes. You think life is good because you are getting all those simps money, your pay pigs paying you. And then you think of yourself as the highest. You start to worship your own self. You think you're perfect. You think you're untouchable. You have no more humility. You make excuse after excuse. You attack everyone who's telling you, be more modest, stop going to parties, stop drinking, stop using drugs. Don't use sex to get your, like your sexual lure to get follows. Spread goodness, not lewdness and immodesty and degradation. But then they shut out everyone, thinking they know everything and they just play rhetorical sophistry games. But Allah is all seen. Allah knows exactly what's in your chest and your intentions. So we have to remember these ayats. Because Allah is most merciful and most kind, but He's swift in accounting. And you can't hide nothing. That's a pretty intense thing to think about. Very intense. The most strong, Quran 5158, the most strong. Your beauty may have power on earthly men who are porn addicts. And who have a masturbation problems. You can maybe get them to uh, sell their car, take out a second mortgage on their house to give you money so they can see your breasts and butts. But that power, your beauty, your crying in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to work. Think about the angel Mikael, right? I believe that's how you pronounce him. He'll be not smiling, he's in charge of hell, pushing the sinners back into the flames of torment, right? Your crying isn't going to get you out of there. How many people are in prison for life? Their crying, their beauty, it's not going to get them out of that prison cell. That guard ain't going to let you go. So if it won't work on a human, what makes you think that the creator of the universe is going to succumb to your heels. Is You're going to just have all that makeup on in hell and you think your boobs are just so perfect and your thighs are just so perfect that you'll just be able to use your sex magic and allure on the creator of the universe? No. Your good deeds is what matters more. Your beauty is not going to be taken into account or how Allah's gonna treat you. You're gonna be held accountable. What did you do with that beauty? You were given a wonderful gift. And how did you thank Allah for it? Did you manage it and control it? Or did you use it as a weapon? And did you use it for sin? Did you break up homes? Did you want married men to lust after you so that he could fight with his wife? Think about it. It's really important. Because now, you know, we're seeing a renaissance of modesty culture coming back. 
Now now I can see more and more Christians waking up to the ethog grifter cause the cosplayers who are pretending to be trad and they're wearing crosses as they dress lewd and bake a cake and have a full face of makeup and you know they have husbands but their husbands are like helping them to create thirst traps online for married men creating calendars of lewdness and sensuality and titillation right so the sin is subtle but yet flagrant at the same time and there's people starting to wake up in America to how the slippery slope began and how it's time to return to orthodoxy that you don't turn into the progressive hedonistic left and the occultists you turn to how your maker wants you to be because those political parties winning elections isn't going to help you on judgment day you'll be held accountable for how you participated in spread sin and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full knowledge of what you did and your beauty will have no power over the most powerful owner of power all strong a woman has a temporary power to manipulate men with her beauty that's why some of those women fear so much on covering up their beauty because they know that they're they they feel like a like a bird who's had their wings clipped a lion who's had its claws taken out when in reality you have done such a remarkable classy courteous action that is prescribed upon us as women whether you prefer the nikah burqa or hijab regardless your allure sensuality should be curtailed by wearing loose clothing it doesn't highlight yourself like yoga pants and you know women working out in basically their underwear in the gym and then complaining when men look more and more now men are waking up to how enslaved they are and more and more women are tired of having fornicators threaten their marriages they want their husband to be loyal they don't think that women being lewd is something good for their culture because as women age they need their man to stick around and not ruin their heart with dishonor and fornication and adultery a woman will lose her beauty she will become more weak and dependent on her man and while she's taking care of her little doves her little sweet children when she gets older she can't go back on the market as easily as a man can so lewd women selling their bodies misusing their youthful beauty and spreading corruption and being part of the occult or a threat or a threat and men in the red pill movement who encourage men to sleep around with married women or any women who will give it to them th that is also a problem because they're tempting wives to leave their husbands authority really something to think about books like this really get you thinking okay so even though we got into the names and attributes of Allah and those that are ascribed to him specific to him and how they are befitting just towards him and how we as the creatures have one that befits us we still can think about how mighty and sublime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and what that means for us okay and how that can strengthen our faith and help us to make better decisions in our life hope you enjoyed this reading if you'd like to join my blog and support the channel it's www.subscribestar.com slash guide hope to see you there